So the next discussion will explore how policies at different levels, journals, funders, and international organizations are important for driving the future of open science. Please welcome Vincent Larivière from Université de Montréal and Baron Mons from Leiden University Medical Center. Hi, uh, so as you can see, there's been a slight change uh, in the panel. Unfortunately, Richard Orton and Jeremy Farrar could not participate in the panel for what I believe are actually excellent reasons. So we're going to have a dialogue between Baron Mons and I. So Baron Mons is a professor of biosemantics and uh, at the Human Genetics Department of Leiden University. Uh, and he's actually president of CODATA, the Standing Committee on Data for the International Science Council. Um, so I'm going to start the panel today by asking him a few questions, and then we're going to take the questions of the public. So I'm going to start with basically the current COVID situation. So as, as you recall, Dr. Mons, in January 2020, the Wellcome Trust issued a, uh, a call for journals and funders to push towards open data and, and to kind of develop various policies to ensure that data is shared. Um, so as an expert in this area, can you share your insights about what needs to be done to ensure data sharing? Sure. Thank you very much for inviting me and sorry for the last minute changes. Um, I would like to start with a bit of a provocative statement that um, I start my lectures now usually by saying we are approaching the end of data sharing. But I will explain. Uh, if you say open science, there is a lot of confusion about the word open and also about open data. So I'm, of course, a promoter of fair data, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable as beautifully explained by Nikki Mulder in the keynote. Uh, and FAIR is not the same as OPEN. We have to make a difference between the data that the Wellcome Trust is talking about, which is publications and research results, which are not personal. But if we want to beat the COVID epidemic, and that is why we are trying to do with data in the Bodon initiative that I started, the Virus Outbreak Data Network, is that we also have so-called real-world observations, patient data, and these personal data cannot be open. It's forbidden, GDPR. But if we want to see the trend in an emerging epidemic as we are facing now, there is one thing that we have established knowledge about viruses and mutations and the immune system and everything. But the real world observations on patients have taken us three months to get access to. Because not only do you have the GDPR reasons that are usual, but now with a highly politicized epidemic like this one, where the Chinese are, you know, and the, and the Americans especially are fighting about, you know, where it came from and so on, countries won't send their data away. So we are moving from data sharing to what I call data visiting, where virtual machines visit the data that stay in the hospitals, for example, where they were collected. So that's a very different view on data sharing than we had in the past. And without that, open science will not fly. Excellent. So, so basically, you know, what, what you said, I believe that there's a, a strong disciplinary component in a way to data sharing. So, so do you think that we should actually develop yes. policies that have a strong disciplinary component? Because again, you can share data on the natural world in the same manner as that on the social world, for instance. Yeah, well, there, there's two aspects. First of all, we should really uh, understand that if you say open to scientists or to people in general, they hear very different things. Many of them also are free, for example, as in gratuit. Now, the, uh, the other thing is you say data sharing, the connotation is that I share my data with you and I send my data physically to you. I lose control. You can do whatever you want once you have the data. And in my case, in a Leiden University Medical Center, it's even forbidden. So I cannot even do it. Now, I can, however, accept your virtual machine, your learning algorithm to come to my FAIR data point, as we call it, and to learn on my data. And that is what we try to achieve in the European Open Science Cloud in many other ways. It's not enough to have open access articles. Of course, it's important, but it's 5% of the issue. Then you can have open data that are not findable for machines, not accessible, not interoperable, and it's massive. And we need these data almost real time. And so we need to take COVID as a high pressure use case for fair and distributed analytics where 
we could have been visiting data in China, Iran and Italy early this year. And I think the data models that we now have built for COVID, which could save millions of lives by or hundreds of thousands of lives by really understanding the disease, could have been there months earlier if we would have access to these data by visiting them locally without trying to get them out of China or get them out of Iran. That's undoable. So, so, so in that context, what would be the role of international organization? Because what you're talking about is in a way kind of an inter interoperable system where countries would share their data despite things yes. centralized in their, in, their, in their own system. So how can that be done internationally? Yeah. Well, what we need is what we call the Internet of Fair Data and Services, where data can be anywhere, as long as they are machine readable and fair. Then the algorithms that visit them travel on very light internet infrastructure. I mean, they are infinitely smaller than the data. Data, in my case, and the geneticists are sometimes petabytes. So you cannot even send them around physically. Uh, and the policy that we also promote very much from CoData is a number of things. Of course, later on, we will probably talk about reward systems for scientists and so on. But the most important thing is that we go to this Internet of Fair Data and Services and we do not fund anything anymore, neither the Wellcome Trust nor whoever, that is not accompanied by a fair data stewardship plan. And I say stewardship and not management because stewardship is also a long-term reuse of the data many years after they were generated and we properly budget for that i wrote an article in opinion about that it's on average five percent of the research budget so we don't have to spend extra money uh, and we have to be prepared to invest in infrastructure for data because everyone wants to fund the rocket science but no one wants to fund what I call the rocket launcher. You know, and without the rocket launcher, the rockets won't fly. So if we do not build the internet based infrastructure for data visiting and fair data, we will not see open science fly, no matter what we do on open access articles or supplementary data. I'm not saying that's not important, but for me, that's 5% of the solution. Okay, that, that's a very good point because quite often we hear that opening data is not so much a technological issue, but let's say a political or organizational issue. So what you're arguing for is actually to also invest in those technologies that would make things easier. Exactly. And it's, it's uh, even so that all the technology that we need is there. So it is just a matter of disconnected uh, ontologies and, and technologies. And we don't have to spend extra funding. We just have to be sure that we don't fund data generation without the proper data stewardship plan and enforce that scientists and anyone else who makes data available does that in a fair format and budget for that in the grant. And then we will get uh, there. Going back to the infrastructure issue, so what would be for you the ideal role of, let's say, public versus private organizations in developing this infrastructure, making there a bit of a parallel between with, with open access publishing, for instance? Yeah, well, again, open access publishing has two sides. Eh? When I was working on malaria years ago, my African colleagues couldn't read, too expensive. In open access, we have to make sure it, we don't get to the situation where they cannot publish because it's too expensive. Somebody has to pay. Eh? So open access is not morally better in any way. It's just another way of doing it. And it's much better for open science. Eh? Let's make that clear. I'm, I'm all for open access. I don't think that's the solution because we still publish for people and not for machines. And machines are our major research assistant now because whenever you put any instrument in my field in the wall, it spits out terabytes of data. So we need machines to interpret the data. And I think we should make the connection to what happened in the Internet. Uh, George Strong, the, the person that started the NSF net in the United States uh, in the past century, believes that next year will be the breakthrough year where industry and public sector will converge to a very minimal central data infrastructure, which is a bit comparable to the TCP IP protocol in the Internet. As long as you keep that, you can build all kinds of infrastructure, all kinds of applications, but they have to adhere to TCP IP. 
And that's what we call the fair digital object, which mm -hmm. essentially means, and that's also my summary of fair, the machine knows what I mean. So when a machine en uh, encounters any digital object in the internet of the future, it should be able to answer three questions. What is this? What can I do with it? And very importantly, what am I allowed to do with it? And that's what we need. And if we all simply as funders and as policymakers require fair output with a good data stewardship plan from everything we fund from now on, we, this will automatically, like the internet, boom, and nobody should own it. It should be built by whoever wants to follow these principles. Uh, I want to move a bit more to the incentives for researchers, because we know that researchers do indeed react to policies. Uh, but we still see that being said that most most researchers don't share their data yet. So there still is, even in the COVID world, there's a minority of paper that actually provide data or code. So what, 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 what changes should we make in the research system and especially on the incentives front mm -hmm. for, for researchers well, to actually do it spontaneously yeah. rather than, than through, through policies? Well, I always say that the two most inhibitory factors for open science, number one is the journal impact factor. Mm -hmm. And the fact that my dean will judge me on my age factor, and I always deliberately say age instead of age. So the older you get, the higher your age factor if you do any good. But anyway, the, so as long as I'm only judged by my, you know, impact factor divided by whatever metrics, why would I share my data? I can use it for another nature paper, you know, and that will count. So if we do, there's only two points in the life cycle of a scientist, we are very stubborn people, as you know, and very obsessed with our science that we listen. One is when we want to get funding, so the funders have a stick, and the second time we ever listen to anyone else is when we want to get a paper published. So the funders should change their policy and the publishers. So the second most inhibitory factor of open science is not, the, the, the first is the journal impact factor and judging people on that, and the second one is supplementary data. So now p people put their data behind a paper and the paper is designed in narrative for people, not for machines. So we hide the links to our data behind something that is a nightmare for machines. Text is the worst for machines you can do. Mm -hmm. It's full of ambiguities and so on. So my statement is the publishers, and I see this increasingly happening, should require that at least the major claims in articles that they publish are also made in machine readable language. And the data that support the paper should be published as a first class citizen with fair metadata independently from the paper. And they should be adorned with a supplementary article. So we should move from data sharing to data visiting and from supplementary data to supplementary articles. The data are published, and of course you need a narrative description of what you did, materials and methods, explaining how you came to your conclusions, but that's for people. Don't mix publication for people and publication for machines. There's an old saying um, that basically sciences advances one funeral at a time. One can say that actually scientific practices and behavior uh, advance funeral at a time. So. Uh, so what's the role of training in there? Because of course, if you want researchers to actually do it, there's, I suppose, a training component that needs to be done, especially at the, let's say, in early stages of yeah. careers. Well, strangely enough, young scientists, unless they are driven into the same wrong direction by judging them on their nature and their science papers only, uh, are very open for this new thing. The silverbacks, as I call them, and I'm getting one myself, so I can easily say that now. Uh, if you read my book about data stewardship, you see cartoons about the silverback scientists all the time. And you know, they they have been uh, becoming silverbacks in the time of the journal Impact Factor. And they were judged on their nature papers and all these things. That was in a data sparse environment. Now that we get to data-driven open science, many of them are adapting very fast, but you know, the silverbacks became deans. The silverbacks are in the panels of the funders. The silverbacks are the reviewers of the nature uh, journals. So they are a big roadblock. And I have a cartoon of a silverback sitting on a rock, reading a book, Seven Ways to Prevent Change. 
and that's called the seven sins of open science. So, you know, I think the silverbacks, indeed, um, you know, we can wait until they fall from their rock, but I think they, many of them are really changing, but others are also actually actively turning against open science. Right? Mm -hmm. So training of young scientists is not so much needed. They, they will be trained, you know, but judging them on the same old archaic criteria for science will still drive them into trying to get their first nature paper. Mm -hmm. oh. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I, and I totally agree with that. The, 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 the emphasis on journal impact factors at the world level is definitely something that has had more, let's say, more, more, more adverse effects than actually good effects. And what's very good at the world level yeah. is that countries like China are actually now moving away from impact factor. They used to give crazy cash bonuses to their researchers. Now it's something that they actually made illegal with, with their funding. So this is, yeah. things are changing on that front, which are actually very good news. Uh, so I actually want to turn it to the audience now. So Marie Pierre, are there any questions from the audience that we could ask uh, Dr. Mons? We don't hear you now. I do not hear you. You don't hear me. Okay. Yes, now I do. Now we hear you. Now you do? Great. Yeah. Okay, so how do you implement processes of FAIR, and FAIR is in the capital letters here, or of FAIR practices in very different research environments? Okay, so we are doing that right now. Uh, we have a conference between GoFAIR and GoData, the two logos you see here uh, in the end of this month. And there is seven workshops ongoing right now where communities like the Sea Data Cloud doing ocean research, nanomaterials, social sciences, health, and so on. Next week, we have Pistoia from all the pharma, and they make a so-called fair implementation profile. So they make decisions, like if we refer to a protein, we use this thesaurus, or to a chemical, we use this uh, vocabulary, and so on. We use orchid for people, those kind of things. They publish that themselves in fair format, so it's reusable. And then we make fair data stewardship plans in these communities. And by choosing the same ontologies and metadata schemas and so on, we drive convergence because the major thing, and now I'm talking as the president of CoData, we have a role to support the sustainable development goals. And if you look at all of them, you will need multidisciplinary research. And it's already difficult enough today to find interoperable data within my field health but if you cross disciplines and for covid you need a lot of social sciences wearing mouth uh, mouth caps or not and you need for example environmental data so we are trying to bring uh, communities together that's what we do in gofair international implementation networks that jointly make decisions and we try to align them so that the machine knows what they mean that's what the summary of FAIR is, the machine knows what I mean. Publish in machine readable format. And communities are very enthusiastically doing that at the moment. And we'll report on that at the end of the month in the big conference. All right, so should we move on to the next question? And don't hesitate to send questions. We still have some time. Uh, that one is from Zach Chandler. How big are the data loads we are talking about here? Well, that it depends very much in per discipline, of course. And I think we are now the worst, the genetics. Uh, you know, when we do a cryo EM microscope, which is a million in itself to buy, and that is fully functioning, it will spit out a petabyte of data per year that's already a lot of money to even store. So we will soon be running out of hard disks and we need to store data in DNA. But really, the, uh, the, the every bit of data from small personal data of a rapid test of COVID to petabytes of data, as long as they are fair, so they are machine readable and findable by fair machine readable metadata, and we don't have to send them around, I don't care about the size of data. Because the, the algorithms are perfectly able to deal with the petabyte of data and search what parts what they need. They do a local uh, learning or analytics uh, method 
and they only take the results. So as long as we agree that we go from data sharing in the classical sense, data visiting, where machines visit the data and never take the data out of their context, I don't care. We can deal with petabytes of data, no problem. All right, question, maybe that will be the last one. Um, it's an anonymous question. What do you mean by machine readable language for supplementary materials? Okay, so that could be a very long, long answer, but we don't have the time for that. Uh, so usually people use one of the variants of what we call RDF, the Resource Description Framework. And it is essentially a structure that machines understand, whereby every assertion in, of the nature, A inhibits B, or you are talking to me, if you have a subject predicate object, so the subject is a unique identifier that the machine can resolve, the predicate, malaria, is transmitted by mosquitoes, then this is three numbers for the machine, and we need an author of that assertion, like for any other article, we call this a nano publication. And this little assertion is machine readable. And you can build entire graphs of reasoning based on these individual nano publications. And that is what machines can deal with. So to give you one example, in the Phantom 5 study, where there was a, a big consortium looking at transcription start sites in the genome, 94,000 or so, we have published every position of every putative transcription start site for those who know genetics in the genome of mouse and man in 16 million nano publications which are attached to the nature paper so the paper gets a citation and each of these individual assertions in the supplementary data is individually citable even by machines but the paper gets a citation as well because it's connected via link so yeah. that is the way to modern data publishing and of course, you can only publish data in machine readable format that can be formatted in this way. You cannot publish a poem or your rhetoric in your narrative article. That's why you need a supplementary article to the data, not the other way around. Thank you very much to both of you. Uh, I think that concludes uh, this uh, very interesting discussion.